In this lesson, we're discussing the powers of the President of the United States. Specifically, we want to focus on the implied powers under the Youngstown framework and the express powers under Articles 1 and 2 of the U.S. Constitution. But before we jump into it, right, as just a big picture refresher from an issue spotting perspective, what are we looking for here on a constitutional law fact pattern to know these things we're going to talk about are at issue? Well, if you think back, right, we talked about Article 3 in the federal courts, right? What did we say there was the issue, right? Well, any time that a federal court is taking some action, usually hearing and deciding a case, remember we said the issue primarily was whether the federal court had the power to take this action, whether the federal court has the power to hear and decide this case, right? And then remember we moved to Article 1 and we talked about Congress, right? Powers of Congress. And what did we say was the main issue there, right? Well, anytime we see Congress taking action, which is usually going to be passing a law, we have to ask the question, well, does Congress have the power to take this action? Does Congress have the power to pass this law? Right, well, when we get to Article 2, right, and the president, powers of the president, it's the same issue, right? If we see the president taking some type of action on a constitutional law fact pattern, our issue is going to be whether the president actually has the power under the Constitution to take this action, right? We're going to see that the president has some level of implied authority, right, where we can kind of imply certain powers from the aggregate of powers that are vested expressly in the Constitution. And we're going to see, though, that there are express powers, right? And we know the president in these cases has the power to take these actions because they're expressly enumerated in Articles 1 and 2 of the U.S. Constitution. Things like the pardon power, the veto power, the appointment power, the commander-in-chief power, the treaty and executive agreement powers, right? We know the president can do all of these things because they're expressly enumerated in the U.S. Constitution. So really one of the more difficult parts of the analysis is what happens when the president is taking an action that's not specifically enumerated, right? How do we know whether the president has the power to take this action or not? And the best thing we can do is kind of look at the Youngstown framework, right? It's important to note here that presidential power is probably the most broad, right? It's the least concrete. If we look at Articles 1, 2, and 3, Article 2 is arguably left intentionally broad, right? If you think about it, when the framers were writing the Constitution, right, they knew when they were divvying out all the powers, right, when they were vesting powers in each branch, that, well, hey, look, when we're vesting power to Congress, this is a large body of people that we're vesting equal power in. Same idea with the Supreme Court, right? There's multiple justices that we're vesting equal power in, and potentially an entire federal court system, right? Well, when they were vesting power in the president, that's one one person you're vesting all of this power in. So notably, they didn't want to be maybe as concrete as they could be in Articles 1 and 3, which makes Article 2 a little bit more broad, a little bit less concrete, which can make this analysis, this analysis sometimes a little bit more difficult, right? Because it's not always as binary as some issues with Article 1 and 3 might be. Right, but with that, we do have the Youngstown case, which at least gives us some framework to look at, right? If the president is taking an action that's not expressly vested to him in the U.S. Constitution, well, at least we have the Youngstown framework to go to, right? And law school professors and the bar examiners love the Youngstown framework, right? It gives you some sort of you know, process to use. So we can start there, right, with the implied powers under Youngstown. So what's going on in this case? It's a really seminal case. It's an important one to know. So we can just break it down, though, a little bit starting with the facts. If you remember, here we have President Truman. It's the middle of the Korean War, and we have President Truman wanting to take control of steel production, right? There's a 
concern that the steel workers are going to go on strike and there could be a shortage of steel. So we're in the middle of the Korean War. President Truman doesn't want this to happen. The military needs steel. So he issues an executive order to his Secretary of Commerce, Sawyer, to go and take control of production of the steel plants to make sure that we do not have a shortage of steel, right? The military needs the steel in the middle of the Korean War. Right, so of course, Youngstown Sheet and Tube doesn't like this, right? They feel that it's outside the president's power to take control of private domestic corporations like a steel company and trying to take control of the production of steel or they feel is outside the president's power right so they challenge this action this executive order issued to Sawyer and it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court right the president in response argues hey look Youngstown sure I might not have the express power vested to me anywhere in the Constitution to take control of steel mills, right? To take control of private domestic corporations and control the production of commodities or different types of products, right? Sure, that's not vested to me anywhere expressly in the Constitution. But if we look at all of the powers I have as a whole, if we look at them in the aggregate, right, and we think about the commander in chief clause and my power as the chief executive, and we aggregate these together, we can see how in the time of you know, war, where I'm providing for national security and we need steel, if we look at my job as commander in chief and as the chief executive of this country to provide for the safety and welfare of our people, right, in the aggregate, we can say I have the implied power to take control of steel production in this limited situation. Right, and of course, we know the court rejects this. They say, good argument, but no, in this case, it's outside the scope of your presidential power, right, to take control of production of steel, right? And the reasoning kind of goes all over the place, right? The, all the judges write concurring opinions, right? It's a six to three opinion. We get concurring opinions. We get the majority opinion. But the most important reasoning we get is from Justice Jackson's concurring opinion. So that's what we're going to focus on because this is the framework that's most used today, right? And this comes from the concurring opinion from Justice Jackson, where essentially he creates three categories, right? And he says, look, to determine whether presidential action is constitutional, right? We have to look at the level of congressional authority the president is acting with. And here he says, look, you know, the president is acting contrary to congressional directions, right? The president is acting in direct conflict with something that Congress has said, right? Earlier, Congress had passed the Taft-Hardy Act, right? And in this act, Congress actually laid out a procedure the president was supposed to use if there was a concern of strike and labor, right? It was like an 80-day procedure, and the president was supposed to follow this procedure, right? In situations like what happens with Youngstown. Here, the president is ignoring that act, right? And he knew about the act, he had vetoed it, he didn't like this act. So the president was very aware, right? And he's acting in direct conflict with a law that's been passed by Congress. So because the president is acting in complete conflict with congressional directions, you know, his act is likely invalid. It's outside the scope of his power. Right, so this is what Justice Jackson is saying. But at the same time, he doesn't want to rule out this idea that the president doesn't have any implied powers. Right, surely the president does have implied powers in some situations. And the way we determine what those implied powers are and whether the action is likely valid or invalid is going to come down to these three categories. Right? You have to put the president's action in the right category, then you can go from there. Right? We know if the president is acting pursuant to congressional authority, essentially Congress has given president the thumbs up, the president's power is at its highest level. It's at its maximum authority. Right? If the president's acting pursuant to congressional authority, we presume that the president's action 
is valid. On the other end, if it's a situation like Youngstown, where the president's action is in direct conflict with congressional directions, we're going to say that the action is likely invalid. That's outside his scope of presidential power, right? This is kind of like the dormant commerce clause analysis, right? And I know we haven't talked about the dormant commerce clause yet, but we're going to get there when we get into federalism. But the idea is, right, Congress comes in and they pass law, right? Regulations, all kinds of stuff. All these are fields of law, right? And say the Taft-Hardy Act is one of these, right? But they come in and they have all these laws, right? The president, if he's going to take action, he has to come in and dodge these, right? He can't be in conflict with Congress. So if he's going to come in and issue executive orders and try to take control of certain actions, or he's going to ask his or command his secretary of whoever, right? Here we have the secretary of commerce, but it could be the secretary of any of the departments, right? The department of education, department of justice, this. He's trying to order them to take some action, right? He can only do so, so long as it doesn't interfere with all of these laws that Congress has already passed, right? If he's interfering with another branch, right, where Congress has passed law, it's not going to be valid. His presidential action is going to be outside the scope of his authority, right? And this is kind of what the second branch is getting at too, even where Congress is silent, right? Congress hasn't expressly told the president, hey, you can do this, or hey, you can't do this. Congress is kind of silent on the issue, right? The president still has to dodge these areas where Congress has already passed law, right? If he's in conflict or he's interfering with the other branch being Congress, right? It's going to be invalid. Okay, so probably the hardest part of this analysis is where Congress is silent, right? The second category, presidential action where Congress is silent. And we're going to say that the action is only valid so long as it does not interfere with the operations of another branch, right? The president cannot usurp the powers of the judiciary or the legislative branch. And the main thing we're looking out for is this right here, right? If the president's going to take an action, he has to do so in a way that's not going to interfere with law that's already been passed by Congress. That's the main thing we're looking out for here, right? Now, if it's in direct conflict, right, where Congress has actually said, hey, look, you know, this is what you do in this situation, right? Well, then that just falls into bucket number three, right? A direct conflict with Congress, we know that the action's almost always going to be invalid, right? Unless he does have the express authority granted to him in the Constitution. If Congress has passed law that says you can't do this very thing you're trying to do, the action is likely invalid. But if it's more in this gray area, well, where Congress hasn't explicitly said you can do this or you can't do this, there's two major limitations. Number one is this, right? The president still has to avoid interfering with the operations of another branch, right? He can't interfere with law that's already been passed by Congress. Also, right, he can't infringe, as always, on constitutional rights of the individual, right? If, his con if he's you know, taking life, liberty, or property without due process of law, if he's you know, not providing equal protection, right? If there's something that he's doing that would be a violation or infringement of a constitutional right, not going to be able to do that, nor can he interfere with the operations of another branch, you know, effectively usurping power from the judiciary or the legislative branches, right? But that's the main idea that we want to look out for under the Youngstown framework. Anytime we see the president taking an action that doesn't neatly fall into one of these categories we're going to talk about here under the domestic and foreign powers, right? We should go to Youngstown and look for what level of authority the president has from Congress, right? And just understand at its core, the highest level of power the president can have that he's acting with is when he's gotten the okay from Congress, right? His action is pursuant to congressional authority. It's at its lowest ebb, right? His power is at its absolute lowest when the president is acting contrary contrary to congressional directions, right? And we know it's somewhere in the middle where Congress is silent, right? That's the main takeaway from Youngstown v. Sawyer. I know it is broad, but that's kind of the point of the case and kind of the point of the discussion of presidential power, right? It's not always clear. It's not always concrete. Every situation is going to be a little bit unique. The best thing you can do 
on a constitutional law essay though is go to these three factors right these are going to give you the best source of guidance as you go through the analysis right and if you actually see category one or three right you kind of know where your conclusion is heading right if we're in category one the action is presumptively valid for in category three the action is likely invalid if we're in category two right it gets a little bit trickier right the justice jackson actually calls category two kind of this twilight zone he uses the word this twilight right because it's gray we're not sure there but the best thing that i could recommend is this kind of chart right here he can't interfere with another branch so essentially you have to look at what law has been passed by congress he's not going to be able to interfere with those laws right and you can't infringe on constitutional rights okay so that's the idea though of youngstown and the implied powers of the president under that framework we can move on from here to the express powers right and typically you're going to see express powers of the president broken up between domestic powers and foreign powers from a big picture right generally it's just a general idea we say that the president has more authority to deal in foreign affairs, right? His foreign powers are, you know, higher than his domestic powers, right? The chief job, in a sense, of the president is to be the leader of the United States in foreign affairs, right? He's our representative in dealing with other countries, our chief representative in dealings with other countries, right? So in matters of foreign affairs, usually the president's going to be given more discretion, more power than in matters of domestic affairs. Just as a general thought to keep in your mind as we go through these, right? But we can start with the domestic powers. And these, by the way, we can get through pretty quickly here. There's nothing too you know, challenging. These are pretty binary. But we can start with the pardoning power, right? The president of the United States has the power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment, right? So here we're thinking about federal crimes, right? We know that the president can pardon federal crimes, not state crimes, right? State crimes, usually that pardoning power is reserved for the governor, but here in a constitutional law analysis, we don't care about that. If we see a state crime, we know the president of the United States cannot pardon state crimes. It's only for federal crimes. Also, right, it can be conditional. There's some case law here on the pardoning power. Right? The president can pardon someone based on certain conditions, right? That's okay. As long as it's a federal crime, that's the main thing we're looking out for here. And of course, this doesn't apply to cases of impeachment, right? The president cannot pardon officers who have been impeached, right? Not going to work. Then we have the veto power, right? The next kind of domestic power. This is a check on the legislative branch, right? The president of the United States has the power to veto any bill presented to him by Congress. So the way that this works, right? We probably all know this. Congress is going to create a bill, right? They wanna make a law, so the first thing they do is create a bill, right? And then they present this bill to the president. Right? And the president, once he receives the bill from Congress, has three options. He can either sign the bill and the bill becomes law. He can veto the bill. Right? He can exercise his veto power, which is going to send the bill back to Congress. And he can do this with some objections, maybe some recommendations. Congress takes it back and they can still, though, make that bill a law if they can get two thirds of each house to confirm it or to approve it, right? So they need the House and the Senate, two thirds of each, and that bill can still become law even after the president has vetoed it, right? But the final option is this idea of the pocket veto, right? So number one, the president can sign the bill and it becomes law. The president can veto the bill, send it back to Congress with some objections, or the president can essentially do nothing, right? And after 10 days pass, if the president has not signed the bill or veto the bill, it's going to come down to whether or not Congress is in session. If Congress is still in session 10 days later, right, we know that the bill is going to automatically become law even without the president's signature. If Congress is not in session, the bill is automatically 
vetoed, right? So if Congress has been adjourned for whatever reason, maybe it's a holiday, right? Doesn't matter. 10 days later, Congress is not in session. We treat it as a veto, right? So it's going to go back to Congress and it goes through that process, right? That's the idea of the veto power though, right? One limitation on the veto power is the line item veto. This is unconstitutional, right? Remember President Bill Clinton tried to do this and the court held that it was unconstitutional. Essentially, trying to veto some parts of a bill but not other parts, right? You go through the bill, the president crosses out the parts he doesn't like but tries to veto only those parts, right? That's a line item veto. It's unconstitutional. It's got to be all or nothing. You either veto the entire bill or you sign the thing into it law, right? There's no in between. You can't cross out the stuff you don't like, right? Line item vetoes are unconstitutional, which then takes us to the legislative veto, which is also unconstitutional. This is INS v. Chada. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudicata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.